Good morning, everybody. If you would, just join us here in the sanctuary. Grab yourself a hymn book. We're going to stand and turn to page 162. To God be the glory, 162. Happy Father's Day to all the dads that are here. we got a gift for you. We'll be handing it out in just a minute. But before we do that, let's have a word of prayer. Brother John Francis, good to see your face, man. If you would, sir, lead us in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for the privilege to be here in your house, Lord, to, to be able to come here and to, to bring praise to you, to, to sing, to, uh, to hear your word. Uh, Lord, I just ask while we're here that you, you open our our hearts and, and our minds and our ears that, that we can hear what you have to say, that you would give the pastor the words uh, that, that you would want us to hear, and Lord, that, that we would take those things and apply them in our lives. Father, I ask if there's anyone here today that doesn't know you, that you would take this day to reveal yourself to them and, to, and for their need for salvation and, and the freedom that you so much allow through, uh, through you. Lord, I, I just ask that you be with the folks downstairs, that, uh, that you give them what they need to be able to, to teach the young folks, and, uh, and Lord, open their hearts, minds, and ears as well. Father, be with us now. Uh, let, it, let us take from this what you would have for us, and we'll give you the glory for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Thank you, brother. Please be seated. Again, so nice to see you today. Just really quickly, as far as announcements go, we are going to be postponing the ladies' uh, prayer time. That uh, was going to be this afternoon at 5.30, just prior to the evening service. My wife said, you know, it'd be, it's his Father's Day, and, and uh, it'd be just a fantastic thing for the moms to say to their, 
uh, uh, to, their to their husbands, here, watch the kids while I go to ladies' prayer on Father's Day. So uh, we are, we're going to back that off till next Sunday. So ladies, be ladies' prayer next Sunday prior to the evening service. Okay, not this afternoon. Uh, but also, uh, just to remind you, come on back tonight, 6 o'clock for evening service. There's going to be some preaching, but it's also a kindergarten graduation ceremony. So we have at least one homeschooler graduated from kindergarten. We have some other kindergartners that have graduated. We want to recognize. And so we're going to be having a, a ceremony this, uh, the, the, during our evening service. That's a 6 o'clock service. So I'll be uh, preaching a charge to the graduates. So uh, please, you want to be there for that. Uh, pomp, circumstance, the whole thing. So come and join us tonight at 6 o'clock for homeschool graduation. All right. Well, we do have a gift for all the dads. I want to hand out. I, I have one up front here. I love it that we have a tractor supply in town and also a harbor freight. These are real guy kind of places to shop. And uh, so what better place to get a Father's Day gift than the harbor freight? And so uh, the ladies got, of course, those, uh, those foldable bags. Very timely, of course, here in the state of New Jersey, now that we're bag-free and straw-free, oh, I feel so good about myself now. And uh, how many of you have walked into a store and said, oh, man, I forgot my bags? It, oh, my. It drives me nuts, okay? And so, um, anyway, these are, I guess these are timely also. These are nice flashlights. These came from, oh, look how bright LED, and they got the thing in the front there. These come from Harbor Freight. Uh, what I, okay. So, fellas, you're, you're driving in the car. The gas prices are through, through the roof. You're, not, you're just like, I'm not filling this tank up till I find something at least two cents cheaper than the last gas station I've been to, right? Am I right? So you're driving around for like a day and a half, and this thing is like, I mean, it's like right there, and you're looking going, yeah, I got a, I got a little bit left. And then it's, it's, it's like 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock at night. It's late, and boom, you're running out of gas. It's going to happen. I'm just telling you. And you're going to have this handy flashlight so that you can walk to the gas station and not stumble in the dark. All right. So very timely gift for you. Um, we have a verse of scripture on here that says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Wonderful reminder the Lord Jesus Christ extends to believers in his day and age. But I, uh, particularly dads. I want to remind you that the light that shines in your life as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ is not just for the world to see, but it's also for your family to see. Your good works as a believer in Jesus Christ, certainly the, it will have an impact on the world that you live in, but I want to encourage you to make sure that your light and your good works has an impact in your family, that your children will see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. For if we win our family to Christ, that is a great and successful life for a believer. So this is a gift for you. I'm going to ask, uh, let's see here. I guess some, there's some young fellas like Marcus. Come on up here, Marcus. He's a young fella. We were talking about Marcus today in Sunday school, but it was the other Marcus, okay? And so uh, let's see here. I need another young fella. So Jonathan, you're a young fella. He looks like young fellowish. Okay, so you're you're gonna have to hold the box. Please notice it's from Harbor Freight, and uh, and so dads, I need all the dads to stand up. I need all the dads. If you're a dad, you need to stand up because you get one of these. So if you guys would walk around and hand out one to all the dads that are here, Marcus, you're doing a great job with the display there. Doing fantastic. Once you get your flash, yeah. Jonathan walked right past you. He's like, Dad, you got a flashlight, man. There you go. Make, get all those dads. Hopefully we got enough there. Yeah, I, I can see that, man. There we go. A couple more dads over on this side here. All righty. Yeah, don't, nah, just don't, don't throw it across. Don't throw it. You, you were tempted to, I know. Raphael, they were going to throw one across the pew at you. But, uh, all right. So, guys, don't play with this during the preaching, okay? Just asking. All right. But uh, happy Father's Day. There's some left? Cool. All right. Oh, good, good. I didn't, I didn't get one, so. All right. Dad, uh, my dad is here today. Oh, you need one of these. You Because your car's going to run out of gas at 10 o'clock at night because you won't fill up. 
You, feel, you live in Delaware where the gas is cheap, right? All right. Anyway, <laughs> happy Father's Day to all the dads. Lord bless you. And uh, I hope that you have a wonderful day today with your family and friends. And uh, God bless you for being a part of our ministry and the impact that you have on the work of the ministry here. Lord bless you. All right. We have a memory verse and then another song. And then we got a special that I could see. And, uh, and then some preaching. So, brother, hey, I got the change bucket down here. Don't let me forget that, okay? All right, Brother Stephen. Matthew 11, if you would. Matthew chapter 11, verse 29. That's what we've been looking at for the month of June. And let's see. I do need, I do need my official pin runner today. Owen, come on down. Thank you, sir. Matthew chapter 11, verse number 29. And if you're there, if you could read that nice and loud with me, it says, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. That's Matthew 11, 29. Anybody can work on that? Add Job, that's a job. Job. All right. Anybody else? George? Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and we shall find rest unto your souls. Got it. Job. All right. Anybody else? Okay. Good job, guys. Thanks, Owen. Jeremy. All righty. And as we get the uh, bucket ready here, kids, we're going to have to take up the missionary kids' offering here if you want to bring up the change on this song. We're going to be turning to page number 183, page 183, Oh, How I Love Jesus, if you would stand and turn page 183. There is a name I love to hear, I love It tells me 
there's within my heart a melody Jesus whispers sweet and low Fear not, I am with thee, peace be still In all love life's ebb and flow Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know, fills my every longing, he keeps me singing as I go, all my life was wrecked by sin and strife, discord filled my heart with pain, Jesus wept across the broken strings, stirred the slumbering chords again. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know, fills my every longing. He keeps me singing as I go. Feasting on the riches of his grace, resting neath the sheltering wing, always looking on his smiling face. That is why I shout and sing. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know, fills my every me singing as I go. Though sometimes he leads through waters deep, trials fall across the way. Though sometimes the path seems rough and steep, see his footprints all the way. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know. My every longing, he keeps me singing as I go. Soon he's coming back to welcome me, far beyond the starry skies. I shall wing my flights to worlds unknown, I shall reign with him on high. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know, fills my every longing, he keeps me singing as I go. Thank you much, Natalie. Boys and girls, if you're in junior church, please head on downstairs. Enjoy. If you would join me in the book of uh, book of Numbers, I'm on the wrong page here. There we go. Join me in the book of Numbers, chapter uh, twenty. If you would please, I'm sorry, I, I'm in the wrong book. I do beg your pardon. No, I'm in the right spot. There we go. Um, everything is disshuffled there. There it is. Numbers chapter 18. I beg your pardon. I'll get the right spot. Get you in the right spot. We'll get things going here. Numbers chapter 18 this morning. And uh, I just want to mention that we had men's prayer last night. Enjoyed that. Had a chance to uh, do the devotion last night. Always enjoy that. And... Um, Appreciate the fellows that come out. I would do and extend the invitation to all the guys that are here. Uh, join us. Uh, the, f- the first and third uh, Saturdays of each month, we spend some time together um, primarily for the purpose of is for a prayer meeting prior to the Sunday service, but we have a short devotion beforehand. So please come and join us on those uh, uh, two Saturday nights prior uh, to, um, to the Lord's Day uh, in the month. So... Numbers chapter 18, I would direct your attention there. We've been going through uh, the book of Numbers uh, the last couple months and, and looking at uh, 
some types and pictures of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, it's Father's Day, and I was going to go elsewhere, and I was just reading this. This is We we're, were just in Numbers chapter um, 16, just prior to this, and, and chapter 17, Aaron's rod that's budded. We were there last week uh, in chapter 17. So I was going to go elsewhere, but I was just reading the beginning of this chapter, chapter 18. I thought this would be very fitting Father's Day message, and you'll see this in just a few minutes. But uh, would you stand for the reading of God's Word this morning? Uh, I talk a lot about generational responsibility here at New Testament Baptist Church. And what I mean by that is that we are not only responsible for our own Christian life and to uh, strengthen ourselves in, in the things of, of the Lord and serve the Lord faithfully, but our responsibility, of course, is always directed um, to, the, uh, to the next generation, and that is uh, whether it's your own children or whether it's the uh, young folks that are here in our ministry, uh, our responsibility is to make sure that we uh, bring them up to serve the Lord faithfully. And so we're going to be talking a little bit about that this morning as we talk about Aaron and his family. And so I just want to remind you that the intention of this message this morning is, to, is certainly to be directed towards the fathers being Father's Day. But there's a lot of application for all of us. So no matter uh, whether you are a dad and you have children, uh, even in your own home or not in your own home, um, whether you're in that situation or whether you are just you are a part of this ministry and your responsibility, of course, is directed towards the uh, people that are younger than you, whether, whether it be bodily younger than you or younger you, than you in the Lord, your responsibility is to make sure that they are getting engaged in the work of the ministry and growing in Christ Jesus. And so uh, this, is, this message is for all of us today, and I hope that you'll take uh, the personal responsibility in reference to that. Numbers chapter 18, beginning in verse number one, the Bible says, And the Lord said unto Aaron, Thou and thy sons and thy father's house with thee shall bear the iniquity of the sanctuary, and thou and thy sons with thee shall bear the iniquity of your priesthood. And thy brethren also of the tribe of Levi, the tribe of thy father, bring thou with thee, that they may be joined, with, uh, joined unto thee and minister unto thee. But thou and thy, and thy sons with thee shall minister before the tabernacle of witness. And they shall keep thy charge and the charge of all the tabernacle, only they shall not come nigh to the vessels of the sanctuary and the altar, that neither they nor ye also die. Let's stop there. Let's pray. Father, I do want to thank you, Lord, for this um, day that's been set apart, uh, Father's Day, to honor um, the, the fathers that are here in our congregation. And, fa and our dear Heavenly Father, I am so thankful that you have been a pattern to us of unconditional love and a desire to see the best of your children. And I pray, Lord, that this message would be an encouragement to all of us, but particularly to the dads that are here in our ministry. And Lord, I would ask you, please, to do a great work to encourage your saints, to save the lost, to honor and lift up and glorify your son, Jesus Christ. For it's in his name we pray this day. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Now, you'll notice it starts off by talking about a, um, a bearing of iniquity. And that's, I want to just kind of, I want to clarify that right from the beginning. Um, this is not telling Aaron and his, and his family that you guys are responsible for everything and it's all your fault and all the sins that have been going on amongst the people, uh, you know, you're going to have to carry this weight. That's, that's not what it's talking about. If you remember from last week, we were talking about Aaron's rod that budded. And, um, you know, when you got to the end of that chapter, if you look at the end of chapter 17, if you please, um, beginning in verse number 12, 17, 12, and it says, And the children of Israel spoke unto Moses, saying, Behold, we die, we perish, we all perish. Whosoever cometh uh, anything near unto the tabernacle of the Lord shall die, shall we be consumed with, with dying. So that chapter ends on a very sad note. Um, if, you, if you recall, um, with Aaron's rod that budded, there was this rebellion against the authority of Aaron and Moses. 
um, who's going to, you know, who has the responsibility of being the high priest. And God just made it very clear uh, that, the, that Aaron is the chosen one of God to be the high priest. And so now all the people are kind of wondering, um, did we really mess up? Is God angry with us? Um, are we ever going to have access to having the sacrifices? Um, and so they're, they're, in, they're, they're in a state where they're kind of wondering, is, is God going to still continue to do this work? allowing the sacrifices to be made, this forgiveness of sin that's going to be extended, um, or, or, or do we just really burn our bridges at this point? So this next chapter is kind of leads right from there and just reminding them that, um, reminding the children of Israel, I'm going to deal with the sin issue. We haven't closed the door on this one. You didn't mess up where I'm just going to say forget about you all. Um, so when he's talking about bearing the sins, what he's talking about uh, in reference to Aaron, Aaron and his sons would be responsible for performing the sacrifices which would deal with the sins of God's people. That's what it's talking about. It's talking about doing the work of God. Sin is always going to play a role in God's work. That is a, it's one of those threads that is woven all throughout the scriptures. You know, it's often said that there's a scarlet cord, a scarlet thread that is woven all throughout the word of God. And that's the, the, you know, the shedding of blood. And, and we see it in the sacrifices. And of course, ultimately, with the, with the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And that's woven all throughout the pattern of Scripture. But the reality of it is, the other thread that runs through it is not a scarlet thread, but a black thread, and that is the presence of sin. And the reason for the sacrifices, and the reason for the priesthood, and a reason for the high priest, and a reason that Jesus Christ came down to this world was to deal with sin. Because sin has always played a role in what God has done it has always been present amongst God's people and in, it will always be present even today amongst God's people. And let me just remind you, because this is Father's Day, right? And we're talking about dads and we're talking about homes. They'll always be present in our households. Always. Sin is a constant. It is always something that is there. Because we are sinners. If we say that we have not sinned, we've deceived ourselves. And moms and dads, as you look at your kids and you think, oh, they're just perfect little angels. Yeah, don't deceive yourself. It's, there's, they're little sinners, every last one of them. So next time you look at your kids square in the face, you say, oh, you're a little sinner. You just, I'm just telling you the truth. Well, the reality of it is when we get up in the morning and look in the mirror, we could say the same exact thing, couldn't we? There's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that seeketh God. So the Bible reminds us that sin is always an issue. And that's what uh, Numbers chapter 18 begins to talk about, that the Aaron and uh, his family would bear the sins. They would bear the iniquity um, of the sanctuary and bear the iniquity of the priesthood. In other words, you need to deal with sin amongst the people, people that the sanctuary, people are bringing the sacrifices in, but also among the priesthood. You know, in other words, you got to clean up, you got to clean your own house. Even the, even the high priest would do a sacrifice of sin for himself and all the priests and all the Levites. They would do sacrifices of sins for themselves. They needed to deal with sin in their own household before they could deal with the sins of the children of Israel as the high priest or as the priest uh, would, uh, would deal with uh, all the sacrifices that were brought. In our households, we must deal with sin. You know, the Bible reminds us, and I'm reading from the book of Proverbs right now. This is Proverbs 29, 15. Many of you parents may have this verse memorized. Some, I'm sure some of you have a list in the front of your Bibles of all these Great verses, things like the rod and reproof give wisdom, 
but a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. What that verse is talking about is, of course, punishment, corporal punishment, and that is, uh, of course, today we would you know, use words like spanking and things like that. It's you know, socially unacceptable, not politically correct to even talk about those things. Uh, but um, you know, the Bible speaks about those things. And when done correctly, um, can do great, it can be a great benefit to every household, rod and reproof. Now, we certainly used to paddle. I'm not here to talk about methods of child discipline this morning. And I don't know what you do in your household as far as child discipline. And, um, you know, some people do the timeout thing. You know, I took, I, we did the timeout thing. You know, I took time out of my busy schedule to give my kids a whooping. Okay, I know that's a joke, but it, it sure does work, you know. Um, uh, but uh, there are, the point of this verse is, is that some parents don't do anything. <laughs> a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. In other words, there's no discipline. There's no direction. There is no intervention by the parents. You know, for some, it's a matter of me. They don't know what to do. And others, they don't care. And there's others that think, oh, everything's going to work out just fine. Um, and if you look at the, what the Bible says, it doesn't work out just fine. Sin is a dreadful thing. It's like a cancer. It doesn't get better on its own. It grows worse and worse. It always brings about destruction and corruption. And the ultimate end is always death, loss. There must be the dealing of sin in the household. Again, here in Numbers chapter 18, that's what it's speaking about. It's speaking about bearing the iniquity of the sanctuary, and thou and thy sons with thee shall bear the iniquity of your priesthood. In other words, you need to you make sure that you guys are suitable for the work that God has called you to do. That's what he's talking to the priest. And I just set this before you as a household, and particularly the dads are here. You have a responsibility to make sure your house is right before God to deal with sin. And maybe it's not a matter of children. Maybe it's a matter of just yourself, or maybe it's a matter of you and your spouse. But either way... It's got to be right there in the home so it can be right here in the house of God. Sin must be dealt with. You know, there's uh, several places of Scripture that I, I'd like us to look at this morning, and these are just examples uh, of, uh, of a lack of attention uh, to this very thing. And, and so if you would, please keep your place here in Numbers, but go with me to 1 Kings uh, chapter 1, 1 Kings chapter 1. And here in 1 Kings is a verse, a portion of Scripture that, that is speaking about King David. Now, King David was a godly man. He certainly made some mistakes in his life. No one is perfect. His were really severe. And when you're a public figure like the king of a nation... When, you're, when you sin, it, it, becomes, um, it becomes headline news. And so uh, there's a lot of issues that David, of course, had to play out publicly in his life. But this particular statement is about one of David's sons, Adonijah. And so if you would, 1 Kings chapter 1, verse number 5, um, this is uh, getting towards the end of David's life. He's getting sick. He's, he's, he's going to be dying soon, okay? Then Adonijah, the son of Haggith, exalted himself, saying, I will be king. And he prepared him chariots and horsemen and 50 men to run before him. And his father, and that's talking about David, had not displeased him at any time in saying, Why hast thou done so? And he also was a very goodly man, and his mother bare him after Absalom. Of course, Absalom is one of David's sons who's dead now. And so this is um, a half, um, uh, excuse me, uh, one, of David's, um, one of David's wives bare this fellow Adonijah. 
David's getting towards the end of his life. Solomon is supposed to be the next queen, uh, king. Uh, Bathsheba is going to make sure that happens. Of course, that was God ordained. But this young man has political ambitions and, and you, all the politics plays into it and the power and all those type of things. But all the politics aside, notice what it says about David. It says his father, verse number six, had not displeased him at any time. In other words, dad never intervened in his life and says, you know, listen, um, this is, this is what's going to happen. I, I, you just kind of take that phrase, never displeased him at any time, and you just kind of play that through. You just kind of fast, you know, you know run, uh, run all the way back to the beginning of this little kid, you know, David pushing the stroller or the shopping cart through the Walmart, you know. I guess they had Walmarts back then. They've always been around. And uh, you're going down the aisle, and little Adonijah's going, I want that! You, you've been in Walmarts. You've, you know it. You know exactly what I'm talking about, okay? And um, no, you don't, uh, you, you don't need that. Oh, my God! Okay, okay, let me get that for you. Put it in the car. No, I want it in a minute. And, and I don't care, you know? And you're walking down there, and, and, you know, and then the next, you, oh, man. <laughs> never say no. Never say, you know, stop doing that. Quit flopping on the floor in the Walmart. That's just not the way we do things. Um, that story is told so many times over where parents refuse to displease their children. Um, we get up in the morning. Let's have some breakfast, you know. It always starts with that, okay? I want, you know, I want marshmallow treat, whatever it is, dripping with chocolate and covered with molasses or whatever. I don't know. No, we're having eggs this morning. Okay? Yeah, hit him again. He needs it, okay? And so this is, this is exactly how that thing plays through. I mean, we're looking at this in a political sense that's mentioned in, in, in the first Kings, but the whole mentality of never stepping in, never wanting to displease your children, it spoils them rotten, and they would never have any type of understanding of, of um, being able to do what is supposed to be done and not just fulfilling the lust of their own flesh. And, and, and as a parent, that's what we're supposed to instill in our children's lives, a sense of responsibility and decorum, a sense of doing what is necessary and not just what we think we want to do because it makes us feel good. And there's, I mean, there's generations that have been brought up that way. And I, I guess we reap what we sow as far as a nation in reference to that, but many families reap what they sow because their children are undisciplined and all they want is what satisfies their own flesh. I just want to remind you that that verse of scripture is talking about King David, a man after God's own heart, the apple of God's eye, King David. If you look at the life of King David, he messed up big times when it came to most of his children. And if David could mess up, certainly none of us are exempt from messing up big time when it comes to our kids. We need to be so careful. Now, back to our premise, and that is that we need to deal with sin in our own household. In reference to this idea of not displeasing our children, often our children are, not, are, are, are needing to be displeased because they constantly want to have their flesh satisfied, and, and that ultimately that leads to sin. The Bible speaks about that, about the lusts of the flesh and the lusts of the eyes and the pride of life. That portion of Scripture in 1 John talks about love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. And if we do not discipline our children, then they are going to be attracted by the things of this world and they will long towards those things 
For Adonijah, it was power, it was authority, it was, I want to be king. I want to be king. No, Adonijah, you can't be king. But I want it. Get the picture? He's the little screaming kid in the Walmart flopping on the floor because he didn't get what he wanted. Why was that? Because David raised him not doing anything that displeased him. Is that the kind of kid you want? Happen to David, it can happen to you. And so we need to be careful about these things and, um, and understand that if it can happen to King David, it can happen to any one of us. I would direct your attention back to the book of uh, 1 Samuel as a, uh, another illustration of the very same type of thing. In 1 Samuel chapter 1, if you're familiar, of course, uh, excuse me, chapter 3, 1 Samuel chapter 3, if you're familiar, of course, with the, with the story of, of Samuel himself, he was raised up. Of course, his wife, uh, his mother's name was Hannah, and Hannah handed him over to e, uh, Eli, the high priest, and he was raised in the temple, but Eli had two sons um, who were wicked men, uh, sons of Belial. They were ungodly in all kinds of ways, and their, uh, and their sin, of course, um, is, uh, is uh, portrayed before us here in the scriptures, but Eli, of course, is, being, is going to be held responsible for it. In 1 Samuel chapter 3, I would direct you to go right to verse number 13. 1 Samuel 3, 13. For I have told him, uh, this is um, the Lord speaking to Samuel and talking about Eli. I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knoweth because his sons made themselves vile, and he restrained them not. Back to our premise from the book of Numbers. you got to deal with sin in your own household. He's talking to the priests. You're going to be responsible for bearing the sin of the sanctuary, but you know you're going to have to also be responsible for bearing the sins of the priesthood. In other words, as a family, Aaron and his priesthood his family, his extended family. Eli was the high priest, and he did not deal with the sins of his family. Those boys became extremely wicked. They were gluttonous men. They would steal portions of the sacrifices. They, had, they were immoral uh, in their behavior with the women there, uh, even by the, by the front door of the, t- of the temple, uh, tabernacle. It's just a horrible setting and situation. And these boys were unrestrained. Dad did nothing about it. Open immorality and dad did nothing about it. He didn't deal with it. When he, when he did talk to them about it, he says, why are you doing these things, you know? And, and, but he, he didn't stop them. He didn't take them out of their positions. He didn't, he didn't deal with them harshly at all. Moms and dads, particularly dads on this Father's Day, you have a responsibility of examining and observing your children and find out what's going on in their lives and understand this, that all of our children, please listen, all of our children are sinners. There is going to be sin that has to be dealt with. And, and, you know... Certainly, you know, we look at it and we say, well, some's not bad, you know, some's worse than others. And okay, I mean, there are some really nasty things that go on and there are other things that don't seem to be as nasty. But, you know, even the smallest of, a, uh, of what seems to be un, you know, just benign is going to end up being a cancerous growth in the life of a child's soul if it's not dealt with. I mean, when the kids are younger and they're rolling their eyes when you're talking to them, you say, well, that's not a big deal. Well, rolling of the eyes turns into some nasty things in the future if it's not dealt with. Rebellion's a rebellion. It could be outright vile and violent rebellion, or it could be the, you know? You've seen it. And, and so everything needs to be dealt with. I, I love what Job does. Job chapter 1. Go with me there, please. Job chapter 1. 
Oh, by the way, Eli's kids die in battle. And then Eli has this, oh, if, it kind of was like one of them heart attack kind of events. <coughs> Falls over backwards. He's a big guy. He's gluttonous also, like, just like his kids. That's another sermon in itself. Falls over backwards and he's dead. Um, there, you know, that, that's, a, that's a very, very strong ending to that story of Eli and his two sons, Hophni and Phinehas. But, you know, the, um, the reality of it is, is sin, sin is always severe. Sin is always severe. And if it's not dealt with, it always ends really bad. And so, it, it, you know, it's best to deal with it in your, in your children's lives. This is how... This is how um, Job dealt with, um, with his kids. And, um, of course, you know, we're introduced to Job in, in Job chapter 1 uh, by name. Uh, we find out he's got, um, um, he's got children. He's got seven sons and three daughters. But if you drop down to verse number, uh, verse number 4, this is Job 1, 4. And uh, I'm going to read two verses here, 4 and 5. And his sons went and feasted in their house, every one his day, and sent and called uh, for uh, their three sisters to eat and to drink with them. And, you know, Job was a very wealthy man, so it's not like his kids had to work. They had servants to care of the sheep. They had gobs of sheep and, and cattle and things like that. And so these, these guys, um, they had a lot of time on their hands, and they, they enjoyed the life that they had. Um, and, and it doesn't, you know, it's not judging one way or the other, right or wrong. It's just saying that's the reality of their life, okay? Dad was a rich guy, and they enjoyed all the luxuries they had, okay? I mean, as being a nomad walking through the desert, you know, I guess you get a limited amount of luxuries, but they had some, all right? And it was so, when the days of their feasting were gone about, that Job sent and sacrificed, uh, excuse me, and sanctified them, and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continually. Now, I, I like this. And, and it, it talks about, um, he sent and sanctified, sanctified then. That word sanctified. The word sanctify comes from the same word that is holy. It means to set them apart. Um, and so... Um, I know in the scriptures when it's talking about, uh, for instance, I believe that's in 1 Peter, it's talking about uh, wives um, sanctifying their husbands unto the Lord unmarried, uh, excuse me, unsaved. Um, because what we're talking about is this idea of, of prayer uh, and pleading with God that God would set them apart unto himself to protect them and to minister to them, and that God would do great things in their lives. Okay, so for instance, you know, as uh, the Bible speaks about in the New Testament about a, a saved wife and an unsaved husband, this idea of of, uh, of winning them not necessarily through preaching, but through you know through um, through a, a life of godliness uh, before them, and it's it's a it's you know it's a great truth in the Scripture, but it also applies to children. And, and that is that we would have this desire to see God work in their lives. And so Job is, Job is not ignorant of, of, the, of the devil's devices. He is not ignorant uh, and to think that his, his children are flawless. You know, Job was a godly man. He's not sitting back going, my kids are like the best. Never do anything. My kids never do anything wrong. They're just... Fantastic kids. I, you know, grew up in a Christian home, and you know, and we did all the right things, and they all, you know, wore the right clothes and carried the right Bible, and we all marched in and the church and sat in the right pew, and you know, my kids are like, Ur. he's like, my kids could sin. My kids may have done something wrong. My kids may have, um, you know, um, cursed God, you know, or this is this is Job's attitude towards his kids. My kids are not perfect. They got flaws. My kids are in danger of, of, of sinning, cursing God. And I, I, I'm going to pray for them. I'm going to pray for them every day. I'm going to pray that God would protect them. I'm going to pray that God sets them apart unto himself 
and God would put a hedge about them and God would guard them and God would protect them and God would show them and God would reveal in their lives the sinfulness. And, and if it, it becomes evident, then, you know, Joe, I, I truly believe Joe would be the kind of guy that would get in his kid's face and say, listen, this is wrong and we need to do something about this and we need to, we need to fix this right away. Uh, you know, there's... Uh, there's, I, I suppose, lots of different ways of dealing with sin in your kids' lives, uh, but, the, but the, the, the point of it is you've got to do something. You've you got to say something. You've got to pull kids aside. You've got to say this is wrong. You've got to point it out. You've got to deal with it. The Bible instructs us to do these things, to not leave our child to himself. Uh, it, it always ends poorly when that happens. Fathers particularly need to remember that there is always going to be sin in your household. Always. And it must be dealt with. Certainly including your own. It must be dealt with, first of all, it must be dealt with uh, scripturally, spiritually, the right way. You know, dads in particular, we're warned in Colossians chapter 3, also in the book of Ephesians, you'll find the same statements. But in Colossians 3, 21, the Bible says, Father, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. Over in Ephesians, it's provoke not thy children to wrath, but you get the idea. And, you know, there's a right way and there's a wrong way to discipline. There's a right way and a wrong way to deal with sin. And there's, there's a lot of times... Um, and this is directed specifically to the dads. So I, I, moms, I'm not saying you're off the hook with this because, you know, you mess up sometimes too. But, you know, I guess dads are worse at it than moms in this case. But we do some dumb things when it comes to dealing with our kids on occasions. Harsh words, violent reactions. We discipline and anger instead of um, scripturally. You know, I've shared with you many times what we used to do with our kids, so you know, I'm not going to belay it, but simply say, you know, there were, there were times where we just say, hey, there's something, there was something we need to deal with, and so let's, let's go. And uh, it doesn't have to be angry. It doesn't have to be chasing a kid around, you know, the room with a, with a shoe or something like that. And uh, it doesn't have to be like that. It doesn't have to be yelling and screaming and shouting and slapping kids or anything like that. I'm not talking about violence. I'm talking about Good discipline. Heart to heart, look you in the face. Would you do wrong? This is what you did wrong. This, and this is what we're going to do about it. And I don't want to ever see this happen again. Do you understand? Yes, sir. Yeah. Because if it happens again, the consequences are even going to get worse. You understand that? Yes, sir. Okay. And let's have at it then. And you all get all said and done, all the tears and all the snot slinging everywhere, and you get all done, you say, all right, and the only reason I did this is because I care about you. You get all the hugs out of the way, and, and um, you get the praying out of the way, you better ask God to forgive you for this one. And, uh, yes, sir. <laughs> Lord, I'm sorry. Yeah, let me, let me hear it. A little bit louder, please. Not that God's deaf, you know. But um, there's, there's a right way. And uh, I want to remind you that there's also a wrong way because it says very clearly, provoke not your children to anger. And there's a lot of angry kids out there because moms and dads did not do discipline right. I want to remind you also that not only do we need to deal with, um, with uh, the sin in our household uh, scripturally, but we also need to deal with it quickly. Another great verse of scripture, in the, again, in the book of Proverbs, Proverbs 13, 24, it says, He that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth him betimes. Now, the word betimes is one of those words you, you got to have to look up and get your Webster's Dictionary out or your, uh, or your uh, Strong's Concordance or, and look up a word, you know, that word betimes. And it's talking about... Um, in a timely way or quickly, prudently. In other words, you deal with it um, because it needs to be dealt with immediately. Now, okay, I know, because this happened in our household also, I know that some of you, it's like, you know, mom's your home during the day, the kids are doing some really dumb things, and it's like, 
when your father gets home. Now, that is, that is not a verse of scripture against that, okay? Because I know my wife had done that several times when my, when my kids were younger, you know? When your dad gets home, so I, you know, I pull in from, from, from work or whatever, and it's like, all right, so-and-so's in the back. This is what he did, and you deal with it, okay? Okay, you know, it's part of the responsibility. That's why I wear the dad badge, you know? And so uh, you just kind of deal with it. I'm, that's not what it's talking about, okay? What that's talking about is, is postponing any kind of discipline or dealing with issues, thinking that, you know, they're going to get over it or this isn't that bad. We'll wait and see how things play out. Maybe you're just, you know, maybe you're like David. You don't want to displease your child, so you're just not going to want to deal with it right now. Um, you know, you take the, you know, the Walmart scenario or whatever. This is, when, when our kids, when we were out in public, um, like for instance, we go to a restaurant or something, our kids, you know, I, I got to say, we didn't do everything perfect, but you know, when you're sitting in a restaurant and some dear, sweet, blue-haired old lady comes up to you and says, your children just behave themselves so well, you know, it, you know you did something right. And I would always joke around like saying, well, you ought to say them at home, you know. But um, one of the reasons why our children behaved in public is because I would say to them when we you know, were in a gr- store, restaurant, grocery store, whatever, and, you know, and they were starting to act up. And I'd say, do you want me to take you to the car? And they know what that meant. That didn't mean we're going over for a joy ride. That meant that it, even if we were in public and they messed up, it wasn't like they can get away with it because dad's not going to do anything. They knew that I would find a way to make sure they understood that what they were doing was not proper. And certainly there were a few. I remember one time going through a grocery store. I'm telling stories now. I'm, and I forget which kid, which kid it was. Uh, Tom, I'm sure it wasn't you because you were so well behaved. Right, Tom? I'm sure. Okay. Yeah. And, and so we were, I remember being in a grocery store and, you know, having a cart and the kids, you know, that we used to shop a lot together. And one of the kids was really goofing up and doing some really dumb things. And I'm saying, if you keep this up, we're, we're going, we're heading to the house right now. And they, they just kept it up. I left the grocery cart sitting right there in the middle. There was nothing perishable. I left the grocery cart sitting right there in the middle of the grocery store, and I took all the kids. We drove back to the house, and boy, that guy got a whooping. And he knew the next time we were in the grocery store and they are starting to act up, that dad is going to actually do what he says he's going to do. Now, I I wasn't mean to my kids. I just made them understand that I'm going to deal with sin, and I'm going to do it betimes. I'm going to do it prudently when it needs to be done, I'm not going to just, you know, say, I'm going to count to 27, and by the time I get there, you better, you know, oh, I hate it when I'm going through a store and you hear a mom going, one, two, you know, and I'm thinking in my mind, two and three quarters, two and seven eighths, two and 15 sixteenths, you know, when I get to three, they never get there, you know, Um, that's just, that's that's not what we did. I I took the word betimes uh, for what it said. And I dealt with sin. I just want to remind you that kids need to be disciplined. And it's, it's not violent. It's not nasty. Um, it reminds them that there are rules, that there is authority, and that there is an expectation of behavior. And there are a lot of kids that grow up with no respect of authority no identification of an expectation of any type of behavior. They're going to do what they want, when they want, how they want. They don't care what anybody else thinks or says. And that's just not the right way to raise a child. And so, um, so we, we, deal with, we deal with discipline scripturally. We deal with it quickly. But we also deal with it certainly out of love. And if you're still there in Proverbs, uh, turn with me to Proverbs chapter 3. And verse number 11 and 12 uh, makes this great statement. It says, my, my son, this is Proverbs 3.11. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. For whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth, even as a father, this, uh, 
excuse me, even as a father, the son in whom he delighteth. So let that sink in for just a moment. A parent that does not discipline their children, does not use chastisement. Okay, chastisement is always not just physical punishment, but it has to do with any type of correction, whether it be you know, a physical correction or uh, any type of instruction, uh, dealing with people. Um, as the Bible used that word chastisement in many other places in Scripture. But if you do not use any type of chastisement, it's an indication of a lack of love. You say, well, I love my kid. I can't discipline them. Well, that's not love. That's not biblical love. That's not the love the Bible speaks about. It's kind of like, oh, I love my kids. I'm going to let them play in the middle of the street in a busy highway. That's because I love them so much because they just want to play on 295 during rush hour. I mean, I mean, it's ridiculous. Wouldn't you think that way? You're driving down the road, your kids go, oh, can I play in the street? You say, oh, yeah, because I, I don't want to displease you in any way. And you pull over, you open the car door and let them run out. I mean, that would be ridiculous, right? Then why do we let them get away with so many other things and let the world run them over? They become roadkill to the world, right? Because you love them so much. Let me ask you this question. Do your children know that you delight in them? That's the word that's used here in this proverb, right? As a father, even as a father, the son in whom he delighteth. Do your children know that you delight in them? That word delight has the idea of, of um, pleased. I, I'm pleased with you. You're going to find it, most of the time that word is used, it's actually used in Leviticus and Deuteronomy. It's used in reference to the law, and it has to do with this idea of something being acceptable to God. Okay? But that's not, of course, that's not the only place it's used. It's used in many other places in Scripture, but, it, but it, most of the time it's used there. It's acceptable to God, that God accepts it. And, and children need to know that they are acceptable the idea of delight even carries along with this idea of, of course, affection. And that's how it's used here in the Proverbs, okay? It's talking about whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth. A father delighteth in their, in their child. The idea of affection. You set your affection on someone. Do your children know that you delight in them, that you love them. Well, of course they do. I'm their parent. Of course they know. Do they know it? Do they hear it? Do you say it? I, again, I'm not going to stand here and say we did everything right, but one thing I hope that my kids never doubt is the fact that I love them. And I, I tell them that often. Even as adults, I kiss their faces and tell them I love them. I love seeing my grandkids now and saying, hey, I love you. They text, of course. I text them, love you. Love you too, pup up. And... Um, I don't want my children to ever have any doubt at all that I delight in them. And because I have delighted in them, I have had to discipline them. You know, a lot of people joke around with being grandparents. You ever see the, you know, grand, grandmom's paddle? You know, it's a big fluffy pillow on a stick, you know. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a great joke. It's funny. I know that. But... Um, it would, you know, when our when our grandkids came over would come over to house, um, we don't we don't play that game with them because <laughs> I love them and I have an expectation of particular behavior that even I have for my uh, that I had for my kids even with my grandkids and, and and it's it's not because we're harsh it's not because you know we're hard to live with it's because I love them and I want to see them. 
Um, I want to see them develop into the very best that God has for them. When God dealt with Aaron and his family, he said, this is what I want you to do. You need to bear sin. You, this, this is your responsibility. As a priest, you have to bear sin. And part of that bearing sin is bear the sin in your own family. Deal with the sin in your own family before you do God's business. Discipline is certainly one of those things. Moms and dads, and particularly dads on this Father's Day, I want to remind you that sin is always an issue. The Lord Jesus Christ came down to this earth. Go back with me, if you would, please, to our text here in the book of Numbers. And I just want to remind you in verse number 2, the brethren also of the tribe of Levi, and the tri this is uh, Numbers 18, 2, um, bring thou with thee that they may be joined unto thee and minister unto thee. And so you see that it was a family business, if you would, the, doing the work of the priesthood and all this. Aaron couldn't do it by himself. It was all the family that was there. And, um, and, and this, this work of the ministry was a joint effort. They served together. That's a whole other sermon that could be preached in reference to our families and serving the Lord together. Uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a family that, and, and, um, in ministering. Um, certainly that, that is uh, something well deserving to be pursued even now, but I just want to remind you that, um, that the, the work, the final and complete work of the sacrifice for sin was not something that could, anyone else could join in with. What Aaron and his family and the priesthood and from generations following, they wouldn't be involved with the sacrifices and the shedding of so much blood and the burnt offerings and the incenses and all those type of things. And then Jesus came. He was our high priest. And by one sacrifice, he, he, he satisfied forever the requirements of the law. Once, as the Bible says, once and for all. It was finished. There was no more need for any other sacrifice. No priesthood would ever be required after that. Aaron was out of a job. It was done. Satisfied. God looked at the travail of the soul of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, as the Bible says in, in, in Psalm 50, or excuse me, in Isaiah 53, verse number 11, and he says, He was satisfied, done. All of what it's speaking about in Numbers chapter 18 was not required anymore after that. The sacrifice of sin was complete. Our responsibility now in our household is not necessarily to deal with sin as Aaron and his family had to deal with sin, with sacrifices and shedding of blood and all this type of stuff. And I guess the way some kids are screaming when they're getting disciplined, you might think there was sacrificing and shedding of blood or something. But um, our, our responsibility is, is to point our kids to Jesus Christ, is to help them to see that there is hope uh, for eternal life found in a person, and that person is Jesus. And so part of that, of course, is in discipline, where we establish the fact that there is an authority in their life. A lot of kids grow up with, with um, a, a lack of any respect of authority. That's very obvious in our society today. But our responsibility is to make sure our kids understand that there is an authority because an understanding of the authority in the home, we prepare them to, to respect and accept the authority of someone, and that someone is God and his son, Jesus Christ. We also, in disciplining our children, help them to understand that there is an expectation, that there is a rule of law, and it has to be accepted. And in doing so, in, in that personal discipline, personal discipline in our home, we introduce our children to the fact that God has an expectation. That's the word of God. It's, it's his law. In disciplining also, we help introduce this reality to our children that all sin will be punished. 
Because many children grow up thinking that they can do whatever they want without consequence. Is there a consequence for sin? The Bible reminds us that the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And in introducing good, godly discipline in our household, we are introducing to our children the understanding that there is sin, that when its sin is violated, it will be dealt with, and that there are consequences for behavior that is unacceptable, and that it, it's going to be dealt with. And so when a child grows and, is, and all of a sudden comes in contact with the reality of the fact that they have sinned against God, who is the ultimate authority, and that the consequences for that sin is eternal death, and they realize the fact that there is go that consequence is going to happen, and they turn to faith and put their trust in Jesus Christ, and, and they're born again. And, and moms and dads, I just want to remind you that you, you have a lot to do with that and laying that foundation of structure in your home, the dealing with sins, the bearing the iniquity of your household, dealing with it. It is a great blessing to be a parent. It's even a greater blessing being a grandparent and being a great-grandparent, okay? It's wonderful. But there is so much responsibility that comes along with it. Because every one of those snotty-nosed kids that we have um, have a soul, a living soul that we're entrusted with. And our responsibility is to make sure that they have an opportunity of hearing and responding to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And part of that responsibility, of course, is bearing the iniquity of our household. And so I would entrust with you, um, as the Word of God teaches us, that you, dads in particular, have to bear that sin, take the responsibility for it, and do the work that God has given you to do, not just for your own sanity, not just for peace and quiet in your household, but for the peace of mind to know that your children will come to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. Let's pray. Father, I just want to thank you. Thank you for the great blessings, particularly the blessings of having children in our household. And Father, here in our ministry of having so many young folks that we can minister to. And Lord, I pray that each one of us would understand that we have a responsibility towards a generation, a generation that needs to be introduced to Jesus, a generation that needs to be dealt with in reference to their sin, a generation that needs to be saved. And I ask you, Lord, to help us to rise to this occasion, to take responsibility seriously. I pray for the parents, particularly here today, they would understand uh, what they need to do uh, from the Bible, and exercise this, um, this responsibility in their homes that their children would begin to understand um, that they stand before God and will give an account. And Lord, that, they would be, that would be introduced to them even as small children in their homes. Now, Father, I pray that you would open up our hearts even this day to receive a message from above that you would convict us, Lord, that you would show us what we need to do. And Lord, for any that are unsaved, Lord, that they would see that Jesus Christ has finished the work and that there's hope at the cross of Calvary. I pray and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.